pretty good crowd for a Sunday afternoon. Glad to see that. All of you stayed. How many of you are filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, you know what that makes you? It makes you the anointed remnant. <laughs> I think you're probably most of you know me. If you don't, uh, I, I'm, I was a Jehovah's Witness for 30 years. I got into it as a teenager and got out of it uh, uh, in my late 40s. One of the big questions that people almost always ask me is that there's two things they want to know if you tell them you used to be a Jehovah's Witness, and that's how did you get in and how did you get out? Uh, and I've told that story before here, but the, the question that really people focus on is what made you see the light? What made you realize that, um, that you needed to get out of that group? And there were a lot of factors involved. Um, I was concerned about the lack of love within the organization that supposedly was Jehovah's loving organization and people tended to be harsh. The elders were harsh with people who had problems. Uh, the love was obviously conditional. There were a lot of legalistic rules that didn't seem to me to be biblical. Uh, questions about teachings, those came up from time to time, usually minor issues at first at least. Uh, I tended to put those on the back burner and just kind of wait it out, wait on Jehovah as they say. And then uh, something happened. There was a couple that I was conducting a Bible study with. Now you know why I did the air quotes, right? Because <laughs> their Bible study isn't a Bible study, it's a, a Watchtower publication study. But this couple went to hear the Setnars speak at uh, a local church in Springfield, Massachusetts, the area where I was living at the time. Uh, and they came back. I wouldn't have gone to hear them, those apostates. Terrible people. <laughs> Sorry, Joan. <laughs> uh, but they came back with all kinds of questions, and now I'm trying to recruit these people into the organization, and they want answers to all these questions, and that required a lot of research on my part. And in the course of that research over years, I learned a lot about the history of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I learned about their long record of failed predictions of the end of the world, and learning about that was really one of the major factors that con convinced me that they couldn't be what they claim, which was God's spokesman. Um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I want to kind of go through this idea of being a false prophet. Uh, I followed a false prophet for many years. How do we spot them? How do we avoid false prophets and false teachers today? Uh, my wife was passing out handouts, I don't know if everybody got those, called the Watchtower's Record, good. And also uh, I have a website which is up on the screen there, dispelthedarkness.org. There's a slightly older version of that handout that's on the website, I'll try to get that changed out this coming week uh, and get the, the current version that you have in your hands up there. But there's one thing that we need to be aware of that Jesus himself said was important enough for us to watch out for. He told us to beware of false prophets. There are a lot of dangers in the world that we need to watch out for. Maybe you can click that one more time and bring up the title there. Thank you. Um, things that can harm us in many ways, but false prophets have the difference in that they can rob us of our eternal life. They can convince people that, we're ser that they're serving God faithfully, as many of us were convinced in that way, when in fact we're not. And, you know, false prophets are not the only deceivers. Uh, Peter warned us about people that he called false teachers as well, and we're going to talk a little bit about them too. Sounds like it's kind of a minefield out there, doesn't it? We have to watch out. There are so many different teachings that, uh, that are, are concerning to us. So we need to spend some time today talking about how we can avoid being deceived, but before we do that, let's uh, just once more ask the Lord's blessing on our discussion. Lord Jesus, we come before you here today. We seek to bring you glory. We want our words to reflect the words that you would have us speak, and, and we want our lives to reflect the lives that you would have us live. And we pray for the Holy Spirit uh, to dwell within us and strengthen us for that. We pray for discernment, because there are many false prophets and false teachers, and we want to avoid those teachings. And, and the people in this room, we want to counter those teachings. We pray for insight into your word and understanding, and we pray for power from the Spirit to hear and to recognize the voice of our Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, here's what Jesus told us to beware of. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of the false prophets you, uh, who, come in sh who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Sorry, Joan, I stole your graphic. <laughs> uh, now, in order to avoid false prophets, logically, we, we have to know what a false prophet is, right? And in order to know what a false prophet is, 
it would probably be helpful to know what a true prophet is. So I want to take a few minutes here and uh, go through a couple of scriptures that will give us a little bit of insight on that. Here's what the Bible tells us about prophets, or some of what the Bible tells us about prophets. Hebrews 1 verse 1, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21, No prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by Holy Spirit. So prophets spoke for God. They delivered messages from God, and the words they spoke were not their own words, but God's words. They were given by the Holy Spirit, carried along by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, as we read through the Bible, uh, we find that oftentimes prophets were sent when people were disobeying God and getting far away from God. I, I can't remember a single instance in the Bible where God ever sent a prophet to tell the people how well they were doing. That just didn't happen very often. Prophets sometimes also foretold the future. Uh, Amos 3, verses 7 and 8. It says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Now, I do believe that there's a bit of hyperbole in this text. God is infinite. He is omnipresent and omnipowerful and all those other omnis. Uh, and therefore, it would be impossible for human prophets to be informed of everything that he does. But the point is that God can and sometimes does use prophets to proclaim future events and to predict things that are, that are happening within his will. We could spend a lot of time going through scripture after scripture to explore all the detail, uh, details of the functions of a prophet, but for the sake of time and of what we're going to discuss today, I just want to consider a list of some of the most important ones that we find as we read through scriptures. Prophets would deliver messages and instructions from God. They would warn of disobedience. Uh, sometimes they would foretell the future, and also sometimes they would answer inquiries. Sometimes the people would actually go to the prophet and say, uh, you know, what is the Lord's word? Uh, they would keep watch over God's people. They would sometimes proclaim God's words to unbelievers, like in the case of Jonah, and we're going to talk about him a little bit more later on. Uh, they would teach the people, and the big one in green, they would speak in the name of God. And that one is really the key. That's the one that, that, that really... Uh, characterizes a prophet. We can get an idea as to how it works from uh, Exodus 4 verses 14 through 17. This is where uh, God had called Moses to deliver his people and Moses objected because he wasn't a good public speaker. So God says, I have a job for you to do and says, Mo and Moses is like, I'm not me, I can't do that. I'm not very good at that. And here's what we read God's response was. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses and he said, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. You shall take in your hand the staff with which you shall perform the signs. This gives us an idea of how God operates through the prophets. Aaron, Moses' brother, because Moses felt like he wasn't a very good speaker, was, Aaron was appointed as his spokesman. Moses would become as God to Aaron in the sense that Moses would give Aaron the message to speak and tell him what to say. He would put his own words, which Moses had received from God, into Aaron's mouth. Uh, yes, into Aaron's mouth. Um, a true prophet is a spokesman for God, someone who delivers a message given to him by God, who has the words of God in his mouth. So having established that, it's pretty easy then to figure out what a false prophet is, isn't it? See, if a true prophet is somebody who delivers a message that was given by God, then a false prophet is someone who delivers a message that he claims is from God, when in fact it's not from God at all. He's putting forth his own ideas. Let's take another look at that text we, uh, we started with in Matthew 7 and see what Jesus said about those false prophets that he warned us about. Matthew 7, 15 through 20, it says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? 
So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. So what does Jesus tell us about false prophets? You won't have to go out looking for them. Jesus says they'll come to you. They'll look innocent. Sheep are used in the Bible as an image of God's people, right? Well, false prophet, prophets are wolves, but they're in sheep's clothing. They look like Christians. Did we click those uh, bullet points? There we go. Um, but inwardly, they're not sheep. They're ravenous wolves, and we all have knows what happens when you put wolves and sheep together. <laughs> the wolves will kill the sheep. We can identify them by their fruits. That's interesting. What are the fruits of a prophet? Prophecy, yeah. You know, we, we sometimes say we identify them by their fruits, know them by their fruits, and we think we're talking about their way of life or their general moral character. And, I mean, that could be a part of it, too. But uh, basically, when we're talking about somebody in their capacity as a prophet, we're talking about their prophecies. That's the, the fruit that a prophet produces. Now, you'd think that God would give us a rule of thumb, wouldn't you? that we could use to evaluate the prophecies of anybody who comes to us and claims to speak for him? Well, he sure did. Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22 is part of the Mosaic Law. It says, But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, How will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So if a prophet is one who conveys messages given to him by God, as we said, how could those messages contain any predictions that would fail? God doesn't lie, and he doesn't make mistakes. Anyone who claims to speak in God's name and yet represents his own ideas as being from God is a false prophet. The proof that the message didn't come from God is that the thing prophesied does not come to pass. So we do know them by their fruits, their prophecies. A true prophet can't make a false prophecy. Just as you don't gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles, it just takes one. It just takes one false prophecy to make a false prophet because you know you're being lied to. This person is saying, I've got a message from God, and it's not. Before we look at some specific examples of that, <clears throat> I want to take just a moment to make a distinction here between false prophets and false teachers. Uh, we decided that a false prophet is someone who claims to speak for God but advances his own ideas as if they were God's, but you don't necessarily have to make a claim of prophecy to be a false teacher. Uh, someone might advance his own ideas that are different in biblical teaching, or he might twist the scriptures so as to deny clear, essential doctrines of the faith. A false teacher is someone who leads people away from Christ, generally tries to get a following for himself, or maybe to fleece the flock and make himself rich at their expense. Paul told the elders of the Ephesian church that such teachers would arise even among them. Acts chapter 20, 29, uh, verses 29 and 30, he said, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So my point is that a person doesn't really necessarily have to qualify in the technical biblical sense of being a false prophet to still be, for us to still reject his teaching as being false. All teaching, everything you hear that relates to the Bible should be evaluated using the Bible as the standard, including what you're hearing right now. And we should reject whatever does not conform to biblical teaching. Now, I would hasten to point out, just so you don't get the wrong idea, that Christians can disagree on non-essential issues. There are things that we can not feel the same way about uh, without branding each other as false teachers and separating from one another. Things like baptism or teach, perhaps teachings about spiritual gifts or the understanding of uh, communion, styles of worship, uh, the music in church, things like that. We can disagree on that, and we don't have to cut each other off from fellowship. But if we start talking about uh, Jesus being Michael the Archangel, uh, or some other non-negotiable, essential feature of the gospel, uh, then that would brand somebody as a false teacher. So, having said all that, have the false prophets come and the false teachers, as Jesus predicted? 
I'd like to take the next few minutes and, and consider a few brief examples of statements that have been made by individuals or groups professing to speak for God. And as we look at them, let's keep in mind that test of a prophet that we read about in uh, Deuteronomy 18. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe that their founder, Joseph Smith Jr., was a true prophet of God. The official uh, LDS website even quotes Joseph himself as saying, I never told you I was perfect, but there is no error in the revelations which I have made, which I have taught. So what are the fruits of Joseph's prophecies? Well, this is my favorite Mormon false prophecy. I heard about it on a Bill Setnar tape maybe 25 or 30 years ago sitting in the uh, parking lot of the assembly hall in uh, Jehovah's Witnesses Assembly Hall in Natick, Massachusetts. A couple, I and a couple of my friends were listening to a Bill Setnar tape. Uh, that good thing nobody came over to the car at that point. Um, in the Journal of Oliver B. Huntington, as recorded at the Utah State Historical Society, and Don Vino mentioned this yesterday, uh, here's what we read that, Jeho that uh, Joseph had predicted. The inhabitants of the moon are more of a uniform size than the inhabitants of the earth, being about six feet in height. They dress very much like the Quaker style and are quite general in style or fashion of dress. They live to be very old, coming generally near a thousand years. This is the description of them as given by Joseph the seer, and he could see whatever he asked the Father in the name of Jesus to see. So whatever he asked the Father to see, he could see in Jesus' name, and what he saw was Quakers living on the moon, a thousand years old, six feet tall, and dressing like normal people. Now, I'm not normally one to make an argument from silence, but I think the astronauts would have said something, don't you? If they had run into any Quakers up there on the moon? Members of the... Uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church also believed that their founder, Ellen G. White, was someone that God spoke through. The uh, document 27 Fundamental Beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists says this, One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church and was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. As the Lord's messenger, her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and cor correction. Well, what does her record show? The book Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, page 259, says when England does declare war, that is against the north uh, part of the United States during the Civil War, all nations will have an interest of their own to serve, and there will be general war, general confusion. The result will be that this nation, the United States, that is, will be humbled into the dust. Most of us are aware that England uh, did not take advantage of the Civil War in the United States to attack the North, and the United States was not humbled into the dust. Remember this fellow? That's Harold Camping. He sort of faded into the background a little bit. I haven't heard as much from him since his uh, end of the world prophecies for 2011 failed. We'd have to class classify Camping, I think, technically as a false teacher rather than a false prophet, because as far as I know, he never actually claimed that God was speaking through him, only that God had somehow enlightened him to be able to interpret scriptures in, in ways that nobody else could. I might be wrong about that, but uh, that's my understanding. Unfortunately, those interpretations were dead wrong, and as he progressed in his departure from truth, Mr. Camping deviated farther and farther from Orthodox Christian teaching in many areas, not just that of prophecy. You probably saw some of these billboards in your area. I know we saw them in our area back in 2011. People contributed millions of dollars to post these billboards all over the country, and they were left high and dry when nothing happened on May 21st of that year, and then again on October 21st after Camping revised his chronology when nothing happened in May. Does that sound familiar at all? Nothing happens, so you change the chronology? Now we've got a couple of supposed evangelicals that I want to talk to you about. This may hit a little closer to home because these guys are not considered by most people to be members of cults. And uh, this one, of course, is Benny Hinn. You've probably seen him on TV at one time or another. And at the Orlando Christian Center on December 31st, 1989, he said this, The Spirit tells me Fidel Castro will die in the 90s. Oh my, some will try to kill him and they will not succeed, but there will come a change in his physical health and he will not stay in power, and Cuba will be visited of God. Well, the 90s are over. Castro's still alive, last I heard, unless something happened this morning. Uh, Benny Hinn said it was the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who told him that Castro would die in the 90s. Was the Spirit mistaken? 
or was Benny Hinn lying about the source of his message? You know, I, I was watching Benny Hinn one time on, on a television program, I guess it was on TBN or something like that, and all of a sudden during, during the program, he's getting a download from the Holy Spirit, it, you know, something, some information is coming to him, and what's that Holy Spirit? What, what did you say, Holy Spirit? And I'm thinking, does God mumble? If you're, if you're getting a message from the Holy Spirit, can't he speak with such clarity that you get it the first time? Another example of a popular evangelical who claims to hear from God is Pat Robertson. He's the host of a popular TV show. I got a little flack last time I gave this uh, presentation over this particular slide. Uh, in an interview with Benny Hinn prior to the 2012 election, here's what Pat Robertson said. He's going to win. Romney will win the election. I absolutely believe that. Because the Lord told me. Now, everybody's entitled to his opinion as to who might win an election, but when you claim that the Lord told you who would win, you are moving from the realm of opinion over into that of prophecy, and you become liable to the Deuteronomy 18 test. And obviously, Pat Robertson failed the test because Governor Romney didn't win the election. I think we all know that. Well, let's turn to the organization that uh, we're most familiar with, I guess I mentioned that I was a Jehovah's Witness for 30 years, and I know a lot of you were Jehovah's Witnesses for many years. This picture here won't be current much longer. Uh, they're selling off the property in Brooklyn, uh, all of the Brooklyn properties eventually, and moving to a New World headquarters in Warwick, New York, which is about 20 minutes from my house. I go by it uh, several times a week, the construction site, and there is a lot of activity there. They're closing off roads and things. I have these nice smiling witnesses with their uh, you know, flag signs and so forth as I'm driving down the road, and they, you know, jockey you over into the other lane and that kind of things and try to smile at you as you go by. I'm waiting for them to hold up watchtowers as I go by, you know, the, the flagging thing. Uh, unlike the previous examples that I mentioned, though, Jehovah's Witnesses don't have a single individual who makes prophetic claims for himself. Rather, it's the organization that kind of refers to itself as a whole, or more specifically, the faithful and discreet slave that says that it speaks for God, which is the governing body, according to the newest light. Well, Let's take a look at some of the claims that the Watchtower has made regarding, regarding its own authority. The Watchtower of April 15, 1943, it said, This is not giving any credit to the magazine's publishers, that is the Watchtower, but is due to the great author of the Bible with its truths and prophecies and who now interprets its prophecies. He it is that makes possible the material that is published in the columns of this magazine. And if that doesn't put a fine enough point on it for you, Watchtower of January 1st, 1942 said, the Watchtower does not consist of men's opinions. That's a pretty good uh, authority claim, isn't it? In fact, the claim is made that all members of the organization are prophets when they act as witnesses for God. A wake of June 8th, 1986 said this, you will be interested to learn that God has on earth a people, all of whom are prophets. Did you guys know that you were prophets before? All of whom are prophets or witnesses for God. In fact, they're known throughout the world as Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, the book Survival into a New Earth, 1984, said, Jehovah had a work for them to do. He put his words, his message, into the mouths of his servants for them to proclaim earthwide. Does that wording sound familiar? That's what we were just talking about a few minutes ago with Moses and Aaron, wasn't it? God puts his words into the mouths of his prophets. That's a prophetic claim, clearly. This organization, as a group, claims to speak for God through its publications. Well, maybe we should examine some of the fruits. If you have your handouts, uh, I made those up so that you didn't have to sit there and, and frantically jot down references. Most of these uh, quotations that we're using are in the handouts. You don't have to follow. We're going to put them up on the screen. But just for later reference, you have them there um, at, You know, after we're done here. Uh, let's take a look at what they said about 1914. The book, Thy Kingdom Come, or Studies in the Scriptures, Volume 3, published in 18, uh, 1898, said, And with the end of A.D. 1914, what God calls Babylon, what men call Christendom, will have passed away, as is already shown from prophecy. You must have missed that in the history books. Anybody aware of that, that Christendom passed away in 1914? Zion's Watchtower of July 15, 1894. We see no reason for changing the figures, nor could we change them if we would. They are, we believe, God's dates, not ours. But bear in mind that the end of 1914 is not the date for the beginning 
like they taught for years and years and years. Not the date for the beginning, but for the end of the time of trouble. That was the, when they tell you Bible students predicted 1914 decades in advance, that's what they predicted. It was the end of the time of trouble. And you notice that the prophecy is explicitly attributed to God. God's dates, not ours. Oh, but there's more, so much more. 1918, <clears throat> finished mystery, everybody's favorite book. Studies in the Scriptures, Volume 7, 19, uh, published in 1917, said also in the year 1918, when God destroys the churches wholesale and the church members by millions, it shall be that any that escape shall come to the works of Pastor Russell to learn the meaning of the downfall of Christianity. Again, were the churches destroyed in 1918? Nope. <laughs> Makes you wonder what we're doing here if they were. 1925, the book Millions Now Living Will Never Die, said since other scriptures definitely fix the fact that there will be a resurrection of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and other faithful ones of old, and that these will have the first favor, we may expect 1925 to witness the return of these faithful men of Israel from the condition of death, being resurrected and fully restored to perfect humanity. I haven't seen them. Uh, now we can move up to the 1940s. Next quotation is talking about uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses Convention in 1941 where they released the book Children, and it was distributed to the children in the audience. It says, uh, this is the September 15, 1941 Watchtower, Receiving the gift, the marching children clasped it to them, not a toy or plaything for idle pleasure, but the Lord's provided instrument for most effective work in the remaining months before Armageddon. 1941. That's a lot of months. That's 865 months and counting. And by the way, that book, Children, was long out of print way back when I became a Jehovah's Witness in 1969. So I guess it wasn't the Lord's most effective instrument for the months before Armageddon, was it? It's hard to get a copy today. Also in the 1940s, they said, uh, Watchtower of April 1st, 1942, now with Armageddon immediately before us, it is a matter of life or destruction. I guess they have a loose definition of immediately. Uh, the truth shall make you free. I like this one. This is such a cool one. 1943, the book The Truth Shall Make You Free said, man on earth can no more get rid of these demonic heavens, referring to the organization of wicked spirits, than man can by airplane or rockets or other means get up above the air envelope, which is about our earthly globe, and in which man breathes. Well, man has certainly gotten up above the air envelope that sur surrounds the earthly globe. In fact, we've gotten right up to the moon where the Quakers live. But, <laughs> but, what, but the Watchtower Society in 1943 didn't think that it was possible to do that. Bill Sutton used to say, time is the enemy of a false prophet. And we've heard that repeated many times since. 1975 is next. I remember this one. Now we're getting into my time frame. The Awake of January 8th, 1968. Fifteen years from 1960. Oh, what oh, I should set this up. They're, they're, quoting from, they're quoting an author who was writing at that time, I believe it was the book Famine, 1975, uh, who was saying that the world would become too dangerous by 1975 to live in. So that's what they wrote in Awake. They said, 15 years from 1960 brings us to 1975. He, that is the author, predicted that by 1975 this world would be too dangerous. Interestingly, this date is also the one indicated by the most reliable Bible research, <coughs> excuse me, as marking the end of 6,000 years of rebellion of men and demons against God. 1975 was to mark the end of 6,000 years of rebellion. And uh, they didn't encourage people to take this lightly the Kingdom Ministry of May 1974 said this, Reports are heard of brothers selling their homes and property and planning to finish out the rest of their days in this old system in the Pioneer Service. Certainly this is a fine way to spend the short time remaining before the wicked world's end. That was 1974. The end was coming in 1975. I have told the story before here about one of my friends in the congregation who was a 20% partner in a waste management business, and he sold out his share in the business in 1969 so that he could support his wife and five children until 1975, when the end came, six years. He had enough money to get through that, and the end didn't come. And he ended up driving the garbage truck instead of owning the company in order to support his family. 
you will know them by their fruits. And here's one that affected me personally. From the Awake magazine of May 22, 1969, it says, if you are a young person, you also need to face the fact that you will never grow old in this present system of things. Why not? Because all the evidence and fulfillment of Bible prophecy indicates that this corrupt system is due to end in a few years. Of the generation that observed the beginning of the last days in 1914, Jesus foretold, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. Therefore, as a young person, you will never fulfill any career that this system offers. Now, 1969, when this was published, was the year that I graduated high school. And it was the year I was baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. You think I could have had a career by now? I said I'd never grow old in this present system of things. Folks, I'm feeling pretty creaky. <laughs> I think I could have done just fine if I'd have gone to college right after high school like my friends did instead of uh, devoting myself to pioneering. I don't know. Here's what they said about the 20th century. January 1st, 1989, Watchtower, it says, the Apostle Paul was spearheading the Christian missionary activity. He was also laying a foundation for a work that would be completed in our 20th century. Now, that appears only in the original magazine edition of that, uh, of that uh, magazine. When they put it into the bound volume and later on into digital format on the CDs, they changed the wording so it doesn't mention the 20th century. But the original magazine did say that. And then the book, The Nations Shall Know That I Am Jehovah How, uh, I believe that book is, I'm not sure if it's still in print, but it's definitely still on the, on the Watchtower libraries. And on page 216, it said, shortly, within our 20th century, the battle in the day of Jehovah will begin against the modern antitype of Jerusalem, Christendom. Somehow we missed it. The battle in the day of Jehovah didn't begin in the 20th century. The 20th century is over. And of course, the big one the 1914 generation, because remember we said earlier that the end of the time of trouble was going to happen in 1914. Well, when that didn't happen, they moved it that the beginning of the time of trouble would happen in 1914. Uh, the reasoning from the scriptures book in 1985, page 97, said, before the last members of the generation that was alive in 1914 will have passed off the scene, all the things foretold will occur, including the great tribulation in which the present wicked world will end. And then the Watchtower of May 1st, 1985, said, Before the 1914 generation completely dies out, God's judgment must be executed. Most of us are probably familiar that uh, with the masthead of the Awake magazine for uh, almost 14 years, uh, it said this. It said, Why Awake is published? Most importantly, this magazine builds confidence in the Creator's promise of a peaceful and secure new world before the generation that saw the events of 1914 passes away. See, again, they, they attribute the prophecy to God. It's the Creator's promise. Was the Creator lying? Or was the Watchtower lying when they said that the Creator made the promise? You don't have to decide that for yourselves, but to help you decide, I would point out that the teaching regarding the generation of 14 of 1914 was changed in 1995 and has changed, what, three times since then? Now they teach the overlapping generation. I mean, I, I guess it's clever. <laughs> Watchtower of April 15th, 2010 said, how then are we to understand Jesus' words about this generation? He evidently meant, evidently, that's one of their favorite words, isn't it? He evidently meant that the lives of the anointed who were on hand when the sign began to become evident in 1914 would overlap with the lives of other anointed ones who would see the start of the Great Tribulation. Now, previously, remember, they said those who were alive in 1914 would see the end. Now they've decided that, you know, evidently, those who, are, who will see the Great Tribulation come, not those who were alive in 1914, but the ones who knew the ones that were alive in 1914. If you, I, that doesn't make sense to me. I can't even I can't even describe it straight because it's so convoluted. But in effect, what they've done is to buy themselves another whole human lifespan. Now, surely, they must have a good, solid biblical explanation for this new teaching, right? Right. In the same paragraph that I just quoted from, in the same Watchtower, they said this. Although we cannot measure the exact length of this generation, we do well to keep in mind several things about the word generation. 
It usually refers to people of varying ages whose lives overlap during a particular time period. It is not excessively long, and it has an end. And you notice they cite Exodus 1, verse 6 in support of this teaching. Well, there you go. I mean, there's got to be proof of this teaching in Exodus 1, verse 6, right? Maybe we can put Exodus 1, 6 up there. There it is. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. Well, that pinches it for me. <laughs> I'm not sure I see the whole overlapping generation spelled out in that text, are you? Here's what they're trying to say. Because Joseph and his brothers, there were 12 brothers, so because they had a large age spread among them, therefore there could be a large age spread in the generation of which Jesus spoke that would see all these things fulfilled. So it might be that the older members of the generation, the ones who saw the beginning of the end time, would be very old when some of the younger members would just be getting started in life. So you could have that overlap of two generations that are really one generation. This teaching relies on a logical fallacy known as equivocation. They've used two different definitions of the word generation and they switch between them to make it work. We use the term generation in a couple of different ways. One is to refer to levels in a family tree. Here's how one internet dictionary describes it. It says, all the offspring that are at the same stage of descent from a common ancestor. Mother and daughter, for example, represent two generations. So all the children of one person or of one couple would be considered part of the same generation, even if their lives, you know, ages were widely separated. You could have a, a man and his wife have, uh, have a child at 20, and then another child at 30, and another child at 40, and another child at 50, and those children would all still be part of the same generation, even though they're 30 years apart in age. You might even, the oldest ones might even have children that are older than the younger ones, but they'd still be considered part of the generation in the sense that they're all part of the same level on the family tree. Now that's the sense in which Exodus 1 verse 6 that we read a minute ago uses the term. Jacob's children were all his children, and despite the wide difference in their ages, they were all part of the same generation in that sense. But there's another sense that we use the term generation. A group of generally contemporaneous individuals regarded as having common cultural or social characteristics and attitudes. For example, they're the television generation. So this use of the term refers to basically everyone who's alive at the same time during a certain cultural situation or a certain series of events. We might refer to the World War II generation, for example. Well, that would refer to pretty much everybody who was alive during World War II, whether they were old or young, and whether regardless of their positions in their family tree. Uh, or we might talk about, as it says, the TV generation or the internet generation. And that's the sense that Jesus was using when he talked about the generation that would not pass away until all things were fulfilled. He was talking to people who were standing right before him at a specific time, who were there to see his ministry. And some of those people would live to see the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the temple in the year 70. Some might have been older, some might have been younger, but he referred to them as a single generation. And what the Watchtower has done is to confuse those two definitions so as to conclude that people spanning over potentially well over a hundred year period could all somehow still be part of the same generation. And it's all because they want to keep that 1914 date alive when it's failed so many times. Now, you, you might think that with all this evidence, all these quotation after quotation after quotation we've just read, that it would be easy to show Jehovah's Witnesses that their organization doesn't speak for God. But in practice, if you confront them with all of these failed predictions, there are a number of excuses you're likely to hear. So, that's kind of where I want to focus now. I want to run through some of those excuses with you and explain briefly how we, maybe not so briefly in a couple of cases, how we might answer them. Here's the first one. We admit that we've made mistakes. There was even a Watchtower article that said uh, that Jehovah's Witnesses can't be false prophets because false prophets don't admit their mistakes. False prophets are the only kind of prophets who have mistakes to admit. If you're really speaking for God, you don't make mistakes, because God doesn't make mistakes. Claiming to speak for God when you don't, now that's a mistake, but they don't admit to that one. How about this one? The apostles had mistaken expectations too, and you know, it's true. It seems like the apostles did expect some things that weren't going to happen right in their lifetimes as they thought. They thought Christ might return within their lifetimes, but they never set a date for it. 
They never went around preaching that it was going to happen on a certain day and attach God's name to it. They never called it the Creator's promise or God's dates, not ours. What makes a false prophecy is not a misunderstanding or a mistaken expectation, but the claim that the prophecy originates with God. Now, there is a specific instance in the Bible that some witnesses, and I've had this done to me, some witnesses will try to use to demonstrate that the apostles taught false teaching in the name of Christ. Uh, and then they'll argue, of course, that that alone doesn't qualify you as a false prophet, so they don't have to be false prophets either. Um, I'm referring to the account here at John chapter 21, verses 20 through 23. Here's what it says. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? In other words, Jesus was telling Peter that it was none of his business what would happen to John, but that Peter needed to keep his eyes on Jesus. Now I had a Jehovah's Witness try to tell me that the apostles went around teaching on Jesus' authority that John was not going to die before the return of Christ. But that's not what the text says, is it? It says that the saying spread among the brothers. That's a different thing than being taught by them and, and taught as actually having a, the authority of Christ behind it. All that had to happen was that somebody overheard this conversation or the, 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 it got relayed to them and it became a rumor that took on a life of its own and spread among the brothers. There's no parallel here to what Jehovah's Witnesses has done, have done, and, and the apostles never went around teaching this on Christ's authority. Another excuse, we don't claim to be inspired prophets, but they do claim to be prophets. We've seen that from several of the quotations. You ever hear of an uninspired prophet? In fact, in the Bible, it's not really the prophet that's, in, that's said to be inspired as the message or the text of Scripture, as the case might be. But if God is truly giving you a message by whatever means he chooses, that's inspiration. That's how it works. To claim that you're speaking God's words is to claim to be inspired, even if you don't actually use the word inspiration. Remember Deuteronomy 18? It didn't say there the prophet has to claim to be inspired. It says if he speaks in the name of the Lord. The process by which God gives the message through his prophet is inspiration. And, and by the way, they don't like to use the word inspired, but they certainly do make the claim. They call themselves Jehovah's channel of communication. They claim to be divinely guided, spirit directed. They say that they're God's spokesman and that he's put his words into their mouths. Do we really need to use the word inspired? Here's an interesting one. Some of you have heard of uh, Greg Stafford. He's a rather imaginative Jehovah's Witness apologist, and he's no longer a member of their organization. He started his own group. But he offered the claim at one point that the organization is not actually a prophet, but only acts as a prophet in the sense that it proclaims God's word from the Bible. Now, that's a misuse of the term, because picking up the Bible and pro proclaiming a message for it is called preaching. It's not called prophesying. Otherwise, anytime somebody picks up a Bible and reads a passage from it publicly, if I were to pull out the Bible and read a, read a verse, uh, I would be a prophet. No, there's a definite distinction drawn in Scripture between those who are prophets who actually speak for God and those who are their hearers. But the claims of Jehovah's Witnesses to prophetic status have been very explicit, as we've seen. Uh, they, they don't claim to be just preaching. They claim to be acting as God's prophet. And besides, even if we allowed that they're only acting as a prophet, wouldn't we have to conclude that they're acting as a false prophet based on their record? All these things that we've seen? Well, here's the favorite, and it's been talked about a few times on this weekend. We've received new light. New light. And this is based on Proverbs 4.18 in the New World Translation, which reads, But the path of the righteous ones is like the bright light that is getting lighter and lighter until the day is firmly established. And they, this is the excuse. This is what they use for all their doctrinal waffling and false prophecies, everything that they've done over the years. The claim that God is constantly providing their organization with greater and greater understanding of Scripture as time goes on. But the text doesn't say anything about any of that. It's talking about the life course of a righteous person. 
and it certainly isn't intended to negate the definition of a false prophet that we find in Deuteronomy 18. As has been pointed out by a couple of prior speakers on this weekend, uh, verse 19 is far more appropriate for Jehovah's Witnesses that the way of the wicked is deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Now here's one, uh, an interesting one, I thought. Oftentimes Jehovah's Witnesses will admit that they've made predictions that failed and tried to speak in God's name on several occasions, but they'll say, well, if that's all it takes to be a false prophet, how about that guy Jonah? He went out speaking on God's behalf. He made a specific prediction that Nineveh was going to be destroyed in 40 days. Nineveh was not destroyed. Anybody heard that from a Jehovah's Witness? Yeah. So Jehovah's Witnesses, well, what about that? Why can't we do that? And I gotta admit, you know, that one made me scratch my head a little bit the first time I heard it. I knew there was something wrong with the argument, but I had to, I, I'm not a debater. I'm not one of these people that just bang, comes up with the answer just like that. If, if somebody hits me with a question, I usually have to sit down and think about it a bit. And once I thought it through, I realized they're confusing the symptom with the disease. They're not trying to harmonize Jonah with Deuteronomy 18. They're trying to use Jonah to wash away Deuteronomy 18 because it's not convenient for them. Because Deuteronomy 18 certainly does convict them of, of false prophecy. But of course, if they can show that a biblical character who's clearly not a false prophet, uh, you know, fits the same description, then, uh, you know, that sort of neutralizes Deuteronomy 18 as far as their own false prophecy. But failed prophecy isn't the essence of being a false prophet. It's the symptom. It's the outward indicator. If a prophet is someone who speaks for God, as we've already discussed, then a false prophet is someone who claims to speak for God, but who is really putting forth his own ideas. Well, where did Jonah get his message? Did Jonah sit down with some scrolls of the Bible and a calculator and work on an elaborate chronology that uh, told him that Nineveh was going to be destroyed in 40 days? No. We are explicitly told in the Bible that Jonah preached the message that was given to him by God. It was God who told Jonah to proclaim that Nineveh would be destroyed in 40 days. Therefore, by definition, Jonah is not a false prophet. He was given a message by God and he, pro he proclaimed it faithfully. So if we have a problem with the message that was given, if we're going to say it was a false message, then our problem is with God, not with Jonah. But what about that? Was God mistaken? Did he lie? Well, not even the Jehovah's Witnesses would claim that. They wouldn't say that a word from God ever failed. If God said it, then it was true, but Nineveh wasn't destroyed. So what's up with that? Well, the answer is found in a principle stated by God through the prophet Jeremiah that's found at Jeremiah 18, verses 7 through 10. God says there, If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do it. Now these statements in context are in the context of, of God comparing himself to a potter and Israel to the clay in the hands of the potter. But he doesn't confine this to Israel. He speaks it as a general principle. He says, if at any time a nation or a kingdom, you know, and he said, what he says is if he declares the destruction of a kingdom and that nation turns from evil, he will spare that nation. Exactly what happened in the case of Nineveh. So we have to understand this principle as being implied in any uh, message of destruction that God sends through a prophet. Whenever he declares a judgment, there's always the possibility of avoiding that judgment through repentance. I mean, if there weren't, why bother declaring the message? Are you sending out a prophet just to scare people? The object of the message is to bring about repentance. So Jonah's message of destruction against Nineveh did not fail. It was a true prophecy, given the terms under which God has plainly stated that such prophecies are made. Now, the book of Jonah doesn't tell us that Jonah offered them an opportunity to repent, and I have to wonder if that had to do with his attitude, uh, or possibly he did and it simply wasn't recorded in the book, but it's implied in the message because that's how God operates. That's how God tells us that he operates in those situations. Now, are Jehovah's Witnesses like that? I don't think that any Jehovah's Witness is going to seriously argue that God inspired all those failed dates that we read about earlier. No, they'll usually say, well, we made mistakes. We were so eager to see God's kingdom come here on earth. 
The problem is the claims that they've made to their own status that we read earlier, as well as uh, even some of the specific dates pre predicted. Uh, the Creator's promise, Jehovah's prophetic word, God's dates, not ours. It seems pretty clear that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses' leadership is presenting its own ideas and interpretations in God's name. And that's exactly what Deuteronomy says is the essence of a false prophet. The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak. Also, you know, if you wanted to look at it from the Jehovah's Witnesses' viewpoint, uh, you'd have to say that, well, in order for those prophecies to fail in a corresponding way to what happened with Jonah, there would have had to be some kind of mass repentance going on. But that hasn't happened, has it? I mean, from their point of view, the world's just getting worse and worse, right? They would never say that the majority of mankind has repented and, and turned around as a result of their message. Uh, they would, in fact, they'd have to make that claim for every single one of the dates. They would, oh, it was going to come in 1914, but they repented. And then it was going to come again in 1918, but they repented. That's a lot of repentances to show, and they can't show even one of them. They wouldn't agree with them. Uh, and keep in mind that their theology would only allow for one kind of repentance, and that's if everybody becomes Jehovah's Witnesses, because you can't approach God in any other way than through his one true organization. And obviously, nothing like that has happened. Rather, the Watchtower has simply referred to its prophetic failures as mistakes. Well, Jonah's prophecy was no mistake. It was a success. It accomplished its purpose, which was to bring about repentance. Really, the only way that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are like Jonah is that they have a bad attitude. You know, Jonah went outside the city in salt because the city wasn't destroyed as he was hoping it would be, and Jehovah's Witnesses simply can't wait for uh, 7 billion people to be slaughtered at Armageddon. Jesus uh, told us to beware of false prophets. He told us that we would know them by their fruits. And uh, we've identified several of them today and have shown in some detail, I think, that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, fit this category despite their many objections. You know, Keith Walker came up to me beforehand uh, with another, another good answer. I think he said, he said uh, if the Watchtower was a true prophet, they would have seen Google coming. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. <laughs> It's a serious matter, though, because, you know, after, Jehovah, after Jesus spoke about identifying false prophets by their fruits, he went on in that same seventh chapter of Matthew to describe their fate. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. False prophets can keep us from eternal life by deceiving us into thinking that we're serving Jesus when we're not. False prophets usually teach a gospel of salvation by works. Did you notice in that text what the ones who were rejected came to Jesus with? works a list of all the things that they did for him. That's not what it's about. Our salvation comes not from what we've done for Jesus, it comes from what he has done for us. Look what the Bible says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. You all know this one. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works. Not as a result of works as a result of works, so that no one may boast. How many hours did you put in? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Jesus gave his life for your sins and mine. He died a horrible death of crucifixion, and he was buried and raised to immortal life on the third day. He did that so that we could be freed from the penalty of sin. What we need to do is believe in him, to repent of our sins, to trust him for eternal life, and to accept the gift that he, give, that he offers to give us. Jesus, Jesus was no false prophet. He is God in human flesh. He died to pay our penalty, and we access his grace through faith, not through works. God will produce the works in us after we believe. If you realize today that the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, whether you're here in this room, whether you're listening over the, watching over the internet or hearing this at some later time, if you see the need to repent and to believe in the one who has been sent by God and who is himself God in human flesh, 
then please get in touch, talk to me, talk to some of the other Christians in this room, because we would cherish the opportunity to help you to know him in a personal way. Let's just close with a word of prayer, if we could. Lord, once again, we seek to bring you glory. We thank you for the sacrifice that you've made for us. We thank you for protecting us and for delivering us from false teaching and false prophets and from, the way, and from the road that leads to hell. We pray, Lord, for your presence, the Spirit's presence in our lives to illuminate the word, for continued discernment, to be able to recognize and expose false teachers and false prophets, and to embrace the truth that you give us. We pray for your blessing on the church and on all of those uh, who are here today, those who are watching over the internet, those who may be listening to this or watching it at some later time. We pray that you will touch hearts through this presentation and through all the presentations of this convention. And as we go home, we pray safe travel and God's blessing on all those present for another year until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.